when we get into spirituality, there's a lot of um, suggestions about what we should be doing, right? Um, a lot of books, a lot of videos, a lot of seminars, lots of retreats, um, lots of you know religious scriptures, traditions, lots of information out there about things that we can do or should be doing. So the difficulty with all of this information, all of these things that we should be doing, um, is that in a sense, they're almost all based on the assumption that what is present right now isn't sufficient. Somehow it's not, not, not present in you or what is present isn't quite good enough or that some, something needs to be improved in order to, um, to reach the promised land, right? In order to get enlightened, um, here's what you have to do. Right. So the premise of all of these instructions, or nearly all of them, is that um, what you are seeking isn't now present. Right? I mean, if it was present already, what exactly are we seeking? So this movement, we'll come back to that question, right? Uh, so this movement is, is sort of an outward movement, right? Looking outside of ourselves for um, experiences, um, you know, a euphoric feeling, visions, greater understanding, maybe adopting the correct metaphysical philosophy, um, maybe just feeling more peaceful, you know, we're adopting practices, meditation, um, you know, trying to quiet our mind, goal setting, right? Change our diet, change our clothes, maybe change our name, change our preferences. So all of this is, all of this is outward moving instruction or the the pointer that um, you are already what you seek is true we don't know it that if it's true but let's just take it as a possibility if that were possible all of these all of these other movements would take us farther away from ourselves because all of them are start off with the denial that what we're looking for is present now. And yet the instruction is you are already what you seek. So we can um, take that as a possibility. If we look, then you know what what is the what is what is the recognition that will sort of settle everything, bring us to a sense of abiding peace. And um, when we really um, make ourselves available to that inquiry, what we find out eventually is that um, there's actually only one thing that satisfies that. Um, and that is the recognition of our inherent unity with source recognition that we um, aren't separate, have never been separate, in the sense of a, having a separate individual self um, is illusory. We find that out. We don't get rid of a separate self. We find out that there never was one. We find out that there never was a separate self to go on this journey to discover its true self. What we find out eventually is that what we essentially are and have always been and unavoidably are is this essential nature. 
So the discovery is what we have always been, not what we can become, right? So that that doorway um, into recognition of our innate inseparability from source is is what ultimately gives peace. So the question is naturally, if if that is truly what I already am, how do I get there? But can, can you see the difficulty of asking the question? Because as soon as we ask, how do I get there? We've already denied its presence already. So any effort that we make to do something to achieve that um, takes us farther away. So the point isn't to attain it, right? To do something to deserve it, to earn it, which would only be a denial of its presence already. What's really necessary is to recognize it, to notice it, to notice what's already happening. So if, if the if what's required is to recognize what's already happening and just to recognize it, then um, any moment will do, right? We don't need to wait for that spectacular um, moment of cosmic explosive experience um, or beatific vision or um, you know, you high euphoric state. We don't need to wait for some future state that we expect and want. Any state will do, even this current moment, even any moment, <laughs> because what is essential to our existence is never absent. It couldn't couldn't be absent, right? What would happen if it were absent, like even for an instant? Would we, I don't know, vanish in a puff of smoke? I mean, not possible, right? So that movement, that expectation, that hope that it's it's not here now, couldn't be, not as I am in my current state of, you know, conditioning or contractions or problems to solve or karma to work out couldn't be couldn't be present here but maybe in the future if a certain set of conditions is realized maybe that special experience happens then then maybe But to, even when we hear um, you are already what you seek, on the one hand, it sounds it's, it's sort of a good news, bad news thing. You know, on the one hand, it, it, it's good news is like, oh, OK, well, um, that sounds attainable, at least. You know, if it's already present, then, you know, I'm not maybe I don't need to spend lifetimes resolving my karma for things that I don't even remember I did. Um, you know, I don't have to earn some unquantifiable degree of merit to before I'm even qualified. If it's already present, then um, it doesn't sound so hard. Maybe, maybe it's if I can just recognize it, catch a glimpse of it, it could happen at any moment. So it seems attainable. And that feels like good news. Right? The, the 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 bad news, the more challenging news is that if it's already present and I feel the way I do about my existence or myself or life, um, if it's already present, that doesn't sound like good news. That sounds like, well, where's, where's the eternal bliss? It's not here now. And if I just allow what's already present to be, you know, to be recognized as my ultimate nature, um, maybe that ultimate bliss isn't even 
possible, right? I'm stuck with what I've got now. <laughs> That's the sense of it, right? Um, so there's sort of this um, self-help new age saying that um, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. So it's sort of that sense. Well, if I just, you know, stop arguing with myself, stop trying to improve myself, then what I'll end up with is just what I've always got, which is this, which I'm not entirely happy about. You know, I want something better. That's my hope. That's that's one of the reasons I got into spirituality is to sort of resolve these feelings of um, not quite right, not quite sufficient, not quite a fulfillment that I'd hoped for in this lifetime. But that's that's presuming that we continue to do what we've always done. And the outcome, yes, you'll probably get what you've always gotten. But that's not what we're suggesting here, right? By allowing, by not moving from our center, chasing things in future experiences or high states or philosophies or um, practices, all of that outward movement, if we just sort of let that be for a while, let that movement of wanting, just let that be and just come back to that simple sense of being, existing, presence, and see what that's like. That we haven't, may not have done before. We may have, even when we're meditating, there may have been this movement about, yes, I'm meditating, I'm putting in this effort, but I want, I want something for it. I want to, I want to pay, pay back, you know, maybe just peace of mind, maybe just to, you know, forget about my issues for 40 minutes, maybe to get enlightened. But we can just check for ourselves to see how much of the time that we spend sitting is it just to be present, just just to be receptive without demanding anything, just to see what's um, already the case before we try to make something else happen. If our if it's if it's our essential nature, it should already be fully present. Right? It is. So one of the things that we um, have a choice uh, to make in this investigation, it's really, it's really sort of a binary choice. We either go left or we go right. Um, and the, the two choices is uh, are to be in it for the truth, to find out. I'm on this journey to find out what's actually true about um, my own existence. The other, the other, the other fork in the road is um, uh, I just want to be comfortable. So the, the the first choice to be in it to find out what's actually true can take us through all kinds of places can take us through, um, drag us through the swamp, you know, because it, it doesn't leave out anything. It requires us to look at everything eventually. So when, if we're in it to find out what's actually true, then things like what we would like to be true, what we hope are true, what we believe to be true, are irrelevant. The only the only thing in that case, the only thing that matters is what is true. 
and in, in your own direct experience. Because this is really um, the unique opportunity that we all have in this lifetime because we, we, are, um, <laughs> we are a manifestation of the one source. And as such, we are perfectly situated to look at what that is. It's not like we're, you know, looking at um, some unrelated species, um, you know, not being able to, you know, discern or only be able to observe from afar. You know, we're in a front row seat to really look within to see um, see what's true, see what our actual experience is. And it doesn't actually matter what anybody else says. At best, a teacher or guru or the greatest avatar that ever lived, the best that they can do is to point in a fruitful direction. And then it's up to all of us to either walk down that road or not. Walk down that road with integrity and willingness and um, maybe a little courage, right? to see what's actually true. Because the alternative is that, um, you know, I just want to feel good. If, if we make that choice, then um, there, you know, there can be a liability that we will be, um, we we'll choose to sort of modify our beliefs and opinions and philosophies um, you know, to sort of keep us within the, our comfort zone. And that's fine, you know, if that's, if that's what you choose. But it's good to know that that is the choice. There's, there's truth or there's opting for comfort. The opting for comfort is sort of like the um, um, well-paid but dishonest scientist that sort of rearranges the data to fit the conclusion that was um, desired from the very beginning, you know, alter the facts to fit the, the uh, conclusion. So the, the looking for ourselves in our own integrity is different than that. It's like, um, What's really necessary is com coming from a place of not knowing. Well, for one thing, that's that is the case. Until we actually see what is true, um, we don't know. You know, we may have read lots of books and stories about um, enlightenment and what it is and how to get there, and we can be quite certain that that all works and about other worlds and metaphysical hierarchies. We can be quite certain about all of that. But until we've actually recognized what our central nature is, um, we don't know. <laughs> it's better, better to acknowledge um, what's actually true than to try to cobble together um, an identity based on a set of beliefs that are always somehow being modified as we go along. So when I talk about what's true, um, the definition that I'm using there is what is um, true for everyone at all times, under all circumstances, uh, compared to which everything else is maybe only relatively true at best, right? So with that definition, there's only, there's actually only one possibility, right? If, if the criteria is something, if it's ultimately true, you know, our essential nature, our, our essence of our being must be true at all times. If, if it wasn't, then, and it was some, somehow absent for even a split second, um, and our, our, our essence depended on it, <laughs> what would happen? We would somehow find ourselves in some alternate universe. 
So true at all times, for all people, under all circumstances. So if it's true for all people, it also couldn't be a belief, right? Clearly, different people have different beliefs. Lots of beliefs out there. Always sort of being upgraded. Belief 2.0. You know, so something that's sort of always being modified, changed, uh, changed, uh, different from person to person, that that also can't be the basis for ultimate truth. So anything within the world of form is always changing, and therefore not stable enough to be ultimately true. So if we ru ruled out anything in the world of form, any belief, any thought, thoughts come and go, have a lifespan, have sort of a flavor to them, also belong to the world of form. Feelings, same. Right? Experiences, also impermanent. So anything having to do with the world of form is subject to the law of impermanence, and therefore not, we can just rule that out as being a possibility for what's ultimately true. So if we ruled out experience, thoughts, feelings, um, ideas, opinions, um, what's left? <laughs> there's, 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 only, there's only one possibility. Right? It would have to be formless, right? because anything in the world of form is impermanent and, not, and therefore not always the case. It would have to be outside of the world of time because it would need to be ever-present. And even just with logic, we can recognize that the only thing that meets those qualifications is spacious awareness. It's of a different category. It's not of the world of form, not subject to time. It's that within which experiences happen, thoughts happen, beliefs happen, feelings happen, sensations. All of those things happen within awareness. We could have these same body minds without the capacity of awareness. But it would sort of be like having the TV on at home with no one there. The TV might still be playing, but no one would know that it was. So we can come to the point of recognizing that this um, Awareness is the only thing that meets this definition of being true at all times, for all people, in all circumstances, compared to which everything else is only relatively true at best, right? So we can imagine some, you know, future experience, let's say, you know, you know, a few um, centuries from now, people travel to some other galaxies and have experience of, you know, meeting other life forms. Um, what will have that experience is still awareness. So whatever, whatever we can imagine, you know, even, you know, the most wondrous enlightenment experience that we can um, 
hope for will still be a temporal event within the field of awareness. Have a lifespan, beautiful lifespan, an energetic movement. But the, that energetic movement in itself is not enlightenment. It is, if it happens, coincident with enlightenment. Right? It happens at the same time. <laughs> but some of it, some of that energetic blow off um, in a moment of realization uh, is actually from relief. Relief of the sudden um, release of, of a burden that we didn't even realize that we were carrying. Letting go. <laughs> sort of like if you, uh, I don't know, let's say some committed um, athlete decided to wear, you know, 10 pound shoe on each foot, you know, to strengthen their legs and use that for, walked around in those for 20 years. And then one day took them off. It would feel great. It would feel fantastic. So the this awareness that we're talking about um, is already fully functional. Um, it, it's already what is living this life. Um, but we, this separate self, sort of takes credit for it. You know, it's like, no, I'm the one. I'm the one doing this. I'm the one thinking. I'm the one making decisions. I'm the one living this life. Me, this body, mind, but mainly my mind. Body sort of gets me around. But basically, you know, command central is um, in my head. And uh, that's what is assessing situation, making decisions, etc. So if it's already the case, um, what do we need to do to see it? Again, the suggestion is just really to look for ourselves, to see what's actually there in our own direct experience. And we can notice this. We can notice what is having whatever experience or perception that we're having. Doesn't It doesn't actually matter if we if we like it or not, um, we might not like that um, fact of life at all. You know, we, we may like, you know, our, our separate self, the one that's in apparent control of things. And this idea of um, relinquishing that identity to something that's not under our control namely this awareness is is not something that um, this egoic self is comfortable with it doesn't like it doesn't like it so there's in this um, journey there's sort of um uh, an attraction repulsion thing happening we like the idea of, of the possibility of abiding peace we like that idea um, and there's something in us that um, believes that it is certainly possible. There's a memory, a cellular memory, perhaps. <laughs> but then there's also this thing about, uh, you know, when I am, when I truly drop into that pure sense of awareness, it can feel like everything drops away. I no longer know who I am. It can feel... Uh, unfamiliar, right? Actually, being in that space isn't um, isn't frightening. It might be new, might be unfamiliar, but it's not frightening. Where we tend to scare ourselves is when we come back into our thinking mind and realizing that we weren't in control and we didn't know where we were. And then that scares us and we can be reluctant to go back there 
again to really see what it is. Um, but the truth of it is that is our deepest nature. That that just pure beingness, right? Prior to form, prior to whatever appears within that. So when we when we first encounter it, it can be a, a, a wonderfully releasing, freeing experience. But it can also be, um, you know, there can also be a sense of uh, uh, not having a floor underneath us anymore, a sort of a falling away. And that can that can be scary. But what it's it's in that space, it's not scary because there's no one there to be scared. Right. What happens is when we come out of that space and look back at it from the egoic self, it can look scary because we sense that um, in that space, this thinking, conceptualizing mind is no longer in control at our deepest nature. And so the... the um, thinking mind that wants to protect, you know, protect its interests, protect, you know, this separate self, um, you know, we'll say, oh, don't go back there. That's scary. Right? But then what we're left with is just everything else on the outside. We're not willing to drop into what is actually true. Then we're left with seeking where it can't be found. Maybe it could be found on the outside just by sheer accident. It can happen. I won't say it can't happen. Just say it's much, much more unlikely to happen. The direct route is just to see what we truly are and then view this condition being from that point of view um, and allow it to be. Allow it to be exactly as it is. And that has transformative value. It has transformative value because it's just, um, we can see it with a clear light of awareness. So this, this awareness has um, certain qualities, right? One of, the, one of the qualities is that it has the capacity to be aware of itself, self-aware. There's also um, a capacity to, uh, sort of a, a luminous capacity, the ability to light up the world, to enliven the world, um, to um, give, give life to the form within, which appear within it. But it, in itself, it's not of the world of form. It's not of the world of time. <laughs> what arises within the world of form happens within the awareness. It's also not knowable. You know, when we first encounter it, it's like um, we don't quite know what to make make of it. You know, it's it's not subject to our um, grasping. It's not subject to understanding like we understand other things, other things conventionally, um, and it never will be. It's not like we can eventually make sense of it all. We can become familiar with it. We can live from it, but we won't understand it. It will be forever mysterious, beautifully mysterious. It also has this unchanging quality. Um, in that sense, it's sort of like sea water, ocean water. You know, wherever you go, it tastes salty. It has that quality for everyone. It's not like different people have different experiences of awareness. Content, sure, different. But the awareness itself, not, not, not possible also is in a category by itself. It, there's nothing, nothing else. <laughs> Everything else is 
and then the more world of form experience etc so it's um, utterly utterly unique it also doesn't require any improvement it doesn't get better over time what changes over time is our argument with it with our attempts to manipulate it with our concepts about it those tend to drop away over time where we allow um, that awareness to function more and more and it functions it actually functions um, in all of us already um, just fine one of the um, things that I think most people enjoy doing relatively well is is driving especially when it's not crowded or rainy or dark or just on a country road, beautiful, um, cool spring day, driving along. Um, because we can do that without the necessity of the thinking mind. We can do it just purely from awareness. The awareness re is, receives um, and notices what's happening, the body responds. We don't have to think about now, turn the wheel a little bit more to the right. No, not quite so much, a little bit more to the left. We, we're not in the thinking mind. It's also what we enjoy about um, sports that we love to do because, you know, we um, condition the body to be able to do, respond, and all we need to do is operate from awareness and the body responds. No need for the thinking mind to interfere. It's enjoyable, really enjoyable. So, but what pulls us um, away from being willing to just rest within this spaciousness is that it, um, when you talk about it, it sounds too simple, you know, it's like, okay, but, you know, where's the juice? <laughs> and. Um, it, the juice may not be immediately apparent. Maybe, maybe not. But I'd, I'd suggest if it's not, if it feels a bit dry, is is to is to give it some time. To trust that the you know ancients that have been talking about this for the last I don't know few millennia um, may may be onto something. You know, so it, it, it's worth giving it half a chance. <laughs> letting it just be, letting it reveal itself um, in its own way, in its own time. It will, it will do that. If we're not trying to make it do something, if we're not trying to control it, demand something from it, if we can just allow it to be, it will reveal itself. The mind, the mind doesn't like it. We might as well acknowledge that up front. The mind doesn't like it. It'll argue, come up with all kinds of arguments. It'll get bored. It'll get restless. Want to run away. Get sleepy. It's just the ways the mind try is trying to take back control. So it's it's good to just recognize that the mind is helpful up to a point, and the point point that we're talking about right now, it will um, it will hmm, you know we we just have to recognize that it may do its thing, <laughs> and we can see that. Um, and, and just, you know, we don't have to try to stop it. We don't have to try to blame it or think that it's doing it wrong. We can just see that, you know, that's how we've conditioned the mind for a few decades and it's got some momentum behind it. It's okay. Okay. So the thinking mind and this awareness are, they're, uh, 
there, there are some dissimilarities, right? The, the thinking mind can only think in concepts. Um, that's what this internal thought stream is. Each word is a concept, a continuous thinking of thoughts one after another, very linear fashion, um, is all conceptual, right? Awareness is not conceptual at all. It doesn't, doesn't have an agenda. It's just aware, just present, just noticing the thinking mind struggling. You know, there's also the sense of the thinking mind always having the sense of, okay, what's next? What's more? You know, not being satisfied. Um, you know, want, wanting, wanting the next thing, wanting to use whatever it has to its advantage somehow. Again, the, the awareness is just, it is just present for it. You know, it's... Um, doesn't have doesn't have an agenda in that way. Also, the thinking mind is um, almost continuously obsessed with either the past or the future, or conceptualizing about trying to conceptualize about the present moment. But what it can't do is be present. The only way we can be present is in the absence of the thinking mind. So the awareness is functional even when the thinking mind is happening, but when we're when our identity is parked in the thinking mind, um, that sense of presence is inaccessible. Still, still there, it's just inaccessible to our experience. And then the thinking mind also sees everything in terms of uh, differences, d distinguishes between this and that, right or wrong, good or bad, up or down. Um, awareness just sees things in terms of unity, in terms of oneness. So, which is which is inclusive of all that duality. Right? It's not taking sides. It's allowing that um, dynamism of duality to be. It's what seems to be what energizes this world of form that we live in. So what stands in our way is really concepts that we hold about awareness, things that we're quite certain about, things that we're arguing about, um, um, rather than just relaxing into that space. That is... Um, the direct, the direct path, <laughs> the direct access into our essential nature, because that's what our essential nature is. That is how it is experienced. It's not a. Once that's recognized, then everything else falls into place. We can give it other names. You know, if you don't like the the word awareness, we can use consciousness. We can use noticing, we can use um, you know, Buddha nature, we can use essential being, we can use the unborn, There's lots of words we can use. But the words don't matter. What is significant is the actual experience of it um, and um, not just as a conceptualization, but actually shifting into an identity that is um, living life from that spaciousness. So I'll end with, uh, there's a story in um, uh, the New Testament, and um, it's actually just a, uh, a short phrase. And the, the phrase is that uh, it's uh, easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Uh, that phrase is generally misunderstood. It's misunderstood to mean um, having to do with monetary wealth, right? As, as if the solution will be, well, I just give away my wealth and, 
you know, eternal bliss is mine. Okay. But it's not actually what it means. But what the wealth that they're talking about is, is the wealth of um, opinions, ideas, judgments, blames, regrets, that wealth, you know, wealth of mental accumulations stored that's what can't pass through the eye of the needle right? it's too big too much baggage you gotta let go of the baggage because what passes through the eye of the needle is formless the world of form isn't isn't our true home you need to let go of um, the baggage that um, weighs us down, right? You know, and when we do, we drop into not knowing. We drop into uncertainty. We drop into um, really viewing things on our own intelligence, in our own direct vision. You know, we can take pointers from other people. You know, saying, well, you know, so-and-so said it was a good place to look, so I'll, I'll, I'll look with some, you know, with some sincerity. Um, but what I find is what I find. You know, I'm not going to take anybody else's word for it. I'm going to look for myself. And um, that's the beauty of it, is that we are in that position to do that. We don't have to take um, anybody else's word for it. There are no middlemen required. Not required because we are a manifestation, as is everything else, of the one source. Therefore, we're as qualified as anyone else to look for ourselves and see what's really true. 